All right, let's take our Bibles and look once again in Psalm 118. And my text is going to be from verse 19 down to verse 24. I thought I might be able to get to the end of the chapter, but it is too much to consider. and Too many things in here for us to ponder. But I've entitled this, Christ the Forerunner. Christ the Forerunner. And in this portion, from verse 19, actually all the way down to verse 29, we see three ways in which Christ is the forerunner with regard to salvation. The first, in verses 19 and 20, he's the forerunner of righteousness. That is, when he came in the flesh, he earned and established that righteousness necessary for God to be just and justify, declare righteous that people that the Father gave him from before time. So he's the forerunner with regard to righteousness. And then the second part that we see here in verse 21 down to verse 24, we see him as the forerunner in that he is the chief cornerstone. When you say chief, that's the principle. He's the preeminent. So when the foundation of salvation was laid in his coming and living, doing, and dying, it was he that is the chief cornerstone. And so we'll look at that together today, verses 19 to 24. But then verses 25 to 29 that we'll look at next time, he's the forerunner as the Lamb of God, the sacrifice that God required. There were sacrifices in the Old Testament leading up to this, but he is the sacrifice in that he came and fulfilled all that was required that God should be just and justify. And uh, that's why you read down there in verse 27, particularly, God is the Lord with has, which hath showed us light, bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. So next time we'll come back and look at that in a separate message. But for today, Psalm 118, 19 to 24, let me read this for us. Verse 19, open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them and I will praise the Lord. And notice specifically verse 20, this gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. So first it took him opening that gate of righteousness and then the righteous, those that have been declared righteous because of his finished work, they do enter into that gate of the Lord. And so he says, I will praise thee for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. Now, we know that this is the psalmist that is writing this, but in the context, as we've been seeing all along, this whole chapter pertains to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here he is praising his father that his father had heard him, as we've seen before, he was heard in that he feared and though he were son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. That's an amazing thing to consider. And when he says here, and art become my salvation, he's talking about his resurrection, that when he had laid down his life and God the Father had raised him again and delivered him from death so that his soul should not see corruption, never did, even though he was a sin bearer, but that's when it all ended. He stopped being the sin bearer when he laid down his life. And the proof of the satisfaction 
before God, if we need any, is that God raised him from the grave. That's why Paul wrote there in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, that he was delivered up for or because of our offenses and was raised again for or because of our justification. His resurrection was the proof that there and then in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father had once for all justified, declared righteous, that people for whom he entered into this gate of righteousness. And so that's one way that the work of Christ is represented. You can picture a gate opening. That tells us that that gate of righteousness was shut until such time as Christ came and fulfilled the law. He earned and established the righteousness and then laid down his life to pay the penalty. That's when the gate was opened. As we're going to see the writer of the Hebrews talking about until that point when the veil was rent in twain at the temple as he died to open up a new and living way. That way had not been opened until Christ came and paid the debt. Those of the Old Testament waited for this time. They were given the Spirit of God to look forward to this time when Christ would come and pay the debt and the gate, the gates of righteousness would be opened. But then you have the picture here in verse 22 down to verse 24 of the stone which the builders refused, how it has become the headstone of the corner. Anybody that does masonry and building knows that there's a cornerstone. Once the foundation is laid, that cornerstone is the stone on which they measure every other stone so that when the wall is built, it is all in connection with that cornerstone. Well, this is how God in his word has pictured. And don't you love pictures? I do love these illustrations because you can visualize what it is for Christ to be that head cornerstone. And then verse 23, we read, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. I know there's some people that when they read about Christ coming, living, dying, rising again, it's just information. They're facts. And uh, some people can recite the facts. If you gave them a test, they'd get 100% on the test as far as the facts are concerned. But Christ has never been revealed in their hearts to such a point where they say, even as the psalmist here, this is the Lord's doing without any mixture from man, adding to or taking from. And it's marvelous. I know we use that term sometimes with regard to certain things. Oh, that's marvelous. But in the scripture, that's a term that is reserved for God only. That which causes marvel and awe and reverence. And so those that are taught by the Lord, when they consider and contemplate, and I speak now from experience, how the Spirit has dealt in my heart revealing Christ in me, I cannot cease to say this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in my eyes because he's given those eyes to see. This is not just a mere profession that people are taught to make and then they say, okay, well, you're, you're good on your way. No. And so verse 24, we'll touch on this in a little bit, but you see in this context of verse 24 when it says, this is the day which the Lord hath made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. How often we've said that because you get up feeling a little better in the morning and it's beautiful and people say, well, how's it going? You say, oh, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Well, that's true. But in this context, what day is the psalmist writing of here? He's 
referring to the day of salvation. The day of the Lord. It's referred to as one day, even though the Lord came and over 33 years, he earned and established this righteousness and then laid down his life. But that day, when he laid down his life, that was the fulfillment of all that the prophets had foretold, all that the law had foreshadowed. And that's the day which the Lord hath made. It was purpose from eternity, but there was that day that came, the hour specifically that the Lord had purposed that all of this should be accomplished. And that's why we read there, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Who will rejoice and be glad in it? Well, those that the Lord has bought and that the Lord has taught and the Lord has brought bought, taught, brought by his spirit because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is how we see Christ the forerunner. Now I'm going to come back to these verses and make a few more comments, but I want us to look over to Hebrews chapter 10 because everything in the old is revealed in the new. This is how we know these things are so. And I remember a day when the epistle to the Hebrews just was a closed book for me. It just seemed like it's all dealing with Old Testament things. And so it was a duty to read until the Lord opened my eyes and showed me that all of Scripture is about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was pictured in the Old Testament, prophesied in the Old Testament, promised in the Old Testament. But the writer to the Hebrews then puts it all together and notice it's to the Hebrews. So this would have been to the Jews in that first century that there were Judaizers going around trying to get them back under the law and away from Christ. And so right from the beginning, the writer of the Hebrews, and we don't know who the writer is, the name is not named, but we know that the Lord by his spirit, used this writer to show the fullness of the Bible from Old and New Testament, united in one, pictured in the Old Testament, fulfilled in the work of Christ. And I often say that the new is in the old concealed because everything about Christ is there in the old in type, picture, and prophecy and promise. But the old is in the new reveal. You won't find any better commentary on these scriptures that we're studying in the Psalms and the prophets and in the law than what we have right here in Hebrews. But in Hebrews chapter 10 and beginning with verse 19, we read here, having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest you see, that holiest was the holy of holies in the tabernacle in the temple. And a high priest could only enter in once a year, and that not without blood. But now he's addressing this to believers, to those for whom Christ paid the debt. And he said, having therefore what brethren? Boldness, that's not presumption, but boldness to enter into the holiest. How? by the blood of Jesus. And verse 20 tells us, by a new and living way. So this shows us then that upon fulfillment of Christ's death, there was a way now opened for those that God the Father had chosen before time, but from beginning of this world all the way to the end, everyone, a new and living way now that he hath consecrated for us, notice, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So that veil that was between the holy place and the holiest of holies was a picture of Christ's flesh, his coming in the flesh. And when it was rent in twain, in two, from top to bottom, when he died, that was an indication then that now was a new way for any in. 
in verse 21 says, Having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession or the confession of, and you see ours in italics, so you can just read it, the confession of faith. When people ask you, what's your confession of faith? We don't go back to some man-made confession. No, our confession of faith is Christ. And we do so without wavering. Why? Because he is faithful that promised. So this is how we see the Lord Jesus Christ as that forerunner entering in to the very presence of God and by his death giving those for whom he died that access and entrance into the very holiest. When you think about being in the presence of God, he's the holy one. How could I as a sinner ever Think of being able to stand in his presence or be in his presence. And yet, here we find our reason. It's not in us. It's all in him. So let's come back here to Psalm 118 and verses 19 and 20 to see how Christ is that forerunner of righteousness. When it says here, open to me the gates of righteousness, I truly believe the psalmist here, as we saw last time, was being given a view of when Christ would enter into Jerusalem, that final week, what they call the triumphal entry. And in this song, we find expressions that were used when he entered in at that particular time. We saw that last time. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And so in this song that doubtless our Lord Jesus Christ would have sung because he sang the songs along with his disciples there at the Passover meal. It says after they had partaken and sung a song, they went out. Well, what songs were they singing? These were Psalms that we're reading here that would have been sung during those Passover times. But here we're seeing him as the forerunner entering in and the gates of righteousness being opened unto him. Obviously, as he went toward the cross, those gates of righteousness, and you may wonder, well, why doesn't it just say the gate of righteousness? Well, the gates had to do with every aspect of the law that was written that he had to fulfill. And so you might look at that and think that there, are, there were many ways in which he had to fulfill righteousness, and therefore the gates of righteousness... It's like in the city of Jerusalem, there were 12 different gates surrounding the city and each gate has it had its significance. There was a gate by which they brought in the sacrifices and I truly believe that's the gate in which our Lord entered in because he was to be the sacrificial lamb. But there were also gates in which they brought in water to be used for the sacrifices. And so as you study the different use of those gates, but here all of this is summarized and represented in the Lord Jesus Christ entering in to that earthly city. Why did he enter in? Well, it was to lay down his life. And so we see him here as the forerunner after his completed work on the cross and after his deliverance from death in the resurrection and being received up into glory. All of this is what this particular psalm is about from beginning to end. But in that the Lord Jesus is the forerunner for his people. Notice this is his request to his father. 
when he says, open to me the gates of righteousness. There's not any one of us that could pray that and just say, well, based on my obedience or based on my good works, open says me. Nope. Those gates remain closed to us, even though we may be of that number of elect that God the Father chose, yet election by itself is not salvation. When God elected sinners, it was unto salvation. Well, here's the salvation that God the Father gave to the Lord Jesus Christ, that people for which he would enter in. And when he says, open to me the gates of righteousness. But even the Son of God could not just simply say, open to me the gates of righteousness. It's decreed and so it's done. No. He had to earn and establish that righteousness on behalf of everyone that the Father had given him. And so he had to work out that righteousness in his life and establish it because he was to be the sinless lamb and then lay down his life to pay the debt. All of this was necessary for those gates to open unto him. And that he did. And that's our confidence. You notice up in verse 19, it says, open to me the gates of righteousness. That's what I referred to when I talked about all the aspects of righteousness that he had to fulfill that, but to fulfill the one righteousness, that's why it says down in verse 20, this gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. All of it summed up then into one gate. Who's the gate? That's Christ. Who is God's righteousness? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's that righteousness for that people that he came to redeem and justify. God justified. Redemption and justification are simultaneous. If you look over in Romans chapter 3 and verse 24. Romans 3 and verse 24. It says, being justified freely. It was free for us, but it cost the Lord Jesus Christ his life. But being justified, and there it's in the tense, having been justified. How is it that sinners were justified? Well, it was through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Romans 3, 24, by his grace, and it says through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You see the connection between redemption and justification? There's some that want to say, well, he died to redeem this people, but those gates of righteousness are not opened for us to enter in until we believe or, or we appropriate it. That's the way people put it. We got to take that righteousness and somehow appropriate it, and then we're justified. Nope. Being justified freely through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That word through means by that redemption that was in Christ Jesus. And it says there for in verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. And there really should be a comma there. You remember I said there were no punctuation marks in the original. You had to read and understand it as it was written. Editors went through and put punctuation marks and so here they put it after through faith in his blood because that was the bias of the translators. They thought it was by faith. But when you read it, faith cannot be the propitiation. Faith is not the propitiation. Faith did not die on the cross. Faith did not satisfy God. It was Christ's death, the object of faith. So read it, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation, and then comma, through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness. How, what is the object of faith? It's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died, 
And that faith declares God's righteousness, notice, for the remission of sins that are past. That word remission actually means the passing over of sin, of the sins that are past. That's what God did until Christ died. He passed over the sins of Abraham and David and all of those of the Old Testament, Job, Isaiah, and name any one of them that were the Lord's. There was a passing over of judgment on their sins, God not imputing that sin to them. Why? Because he purposed to impute it or put it to the account of his son when he died. That's why the psalmist says, this is the day that the Lord has made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. When the Lord opens your heart to see Christ and to understand that when he died, that sin was dealt with. It's not when you believe, it was when he died. And here's a, an attribute of God that is not preached enough. In verse 25, it says, through forbearance or the forbearance of God. God was forbearing with the sin. It's not as if he was gritting his teeth and trying to hold back and think, oh no, I, I don't want to have to judge him. No, it's a forbearance of love. Having loved those that he had chosen, he was forbearing with them. And some might look at that and think, well then he was not being equitable because here were all these others that he condemned and judged. Well, he's equitable. You can never accuse God of being inequitable. But in forbearance, he was forbearing because he had purposed all along to put that sin on his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would come and earn and establish this righteousness. And he did. And that's why Paul writes there in verse 26, notice, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness. At what time? Well, since the cross. His righteousness... In other words, that Christ had earned and established and paid the debt. And now God was just to justify. That's what it says there, that he might be just. The just God and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. The believing in Jesus is the evidence that when Christ died, I was justified. It's not the cause of of me being justified when it says the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. When one's brought to believe in Jesus, their eyes are open to see that when Christ died, I was justified. That's a glorious truth. And that's how we see Christ as being the forerunner, the fulfiller of that righteousness that was necessary. And that's why in verse 20, coming back to my text, in Psalm 118, the gate of the Lord now has been opened. How? Christ the forerunner, into which the righteous shall enter. When it says shall enter, that means there are still those for whom Christ paid the debt that are not yet perhaps even born. Or some that are living now that may not yet still be drawn. But when the Spirit draws them, this is the gate in which they enter in. They entered in when he arose and ascended on high. And they're seated with him in the heavenlies. But now by faith they enter in to that very gate. Because Christ has been made to be their forerunner, their righteousness. So that's the first part of this. Then we move to the second from verse 21 down to verse 24. And we see a different metaphor used here, and that is of the chief cornerstone. When he says in verse 21, I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. Again, think of Christ as he's entering into that city of Jerusalem. Now to fulfill all that has been written of him. And he says, I will praise thee. That's what Christ was doing. He was not fearful of going to the cross. All the while, he 
was praising his father that that hour had come. That's an amazing thing when you think about it. It was for this reason that he had come to live this life and to lay down his life that he might redeem and God justify that people. That's why he said, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, suffering the shame, and now is set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. But here, though he was entering in, coming to accomplish this salvation, this righteousness, we know that there were those that opposed just like people do today. They don't like to hear of a Christ to whom all the glory is given. Man always wants his part in it. Something he can contribute, something he can add, at least to be able to say, well, at least I did my part. Now, all the glory belongs unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And he praised his father for having heard him, not only in his life, but in his death, and through that, be, he, he says, and art become my salvation. His deliverance, that's how that word means. Deliverance from death and deliverance from having to continue to bear the sin. He's no longer the sin bearer. It's been put away. Where he is now in heaven, ever living to intercede, his presence there is the intercession for which God continues to forgive and justify that people for whom he paid the debt. But there were those that turned thumbs down on him. Here it says the stone in verse 22, which the builders rejected. People can turn away from this message and reject it and fight at it and disagree, but it doesn't change the reality. Here it says the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone or the head of the corner when it says is become again we're talking about a salvation that had to be worked out in time this foundation laid i know there are those that argue well god's eternal and his decrees are eternal and therefore he's not bound by time well he created time when you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, why did he create time? Why did he create this world? It's for one purpose, to bring his son into it, that in the fullness of the time, it says there in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, that Christ should come, being made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem those that were under the law. You see, even the elect were under the law. That law stood against them until Christ came and took away all of the law by fulfilling it and laying down his life. But there are those here where it says the builders rejected. What builders were they? Well, those were the Pharisees. Those were the Jews. They were the ones that had the law. They were the interpreters of the law. And yet, rather than point sinners to Christ as he came into this world like John the Baptist said behold the Lamb of God you say well what made the difference well the Pharisees were blinded but John being given the Spirit the Spirit of God being in him could do nothing but point sinners to Christ but this is a strong and important statement that we find declared here in the Old Testament that is repeated many times in the New Testament. That's how we know this pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ because Christ himself quoted this in the Gospels. Peter quoted it with reference to the Lord Jesus. Paul did also in Ephesians. And I don't know as there's any Old Testament text that is quoted in the New Testament more than this one. Let's just take a look at a couple of examples. In Matthew chapter 21, this is where our Lord spoke of this with regard to himself. He was speaking a parable here in Matthew 21, the parable of the husbandman. 
And in verse 41, of course, addressing this to those Jews who rejected him, they say unto him, verse 41, Matthew 21, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits uh, in their seasons. Well, how was that fulfilled? The Lord removed his hand from the Jewish nation and the other nation or other husbandmen refers to the Gentiles that the Lord purposed to save and that he is even now calling in to this kingdom. But in verse 42, Jesus saith unto them, did ye never read in the scriptures? And here it is what he's quoting. The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in his eyes. And there's others in the Gospels where he quotes it. So that's our Lord. And then Peter, if you go over to Acts chapter 4, this is after Christ has ascended and Peter is declaring Christ the crucified one, risen, ascended on high before the, the people and the priests and the Sadducees. And in verse 11, well, starting in verse 10, he said, Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. They were called into question because they'd healed a lame man in front of the temple. The Pharisees couldn't give him healing. The law couldn't give him healing. But Christ, the fulfillment of the law did. And that's what Peter's declaring. And you notice he didn't hold back when they asked him by whose name these things were done. That's back in verse 7 when they had set them, Peter and John, in the midst. They asked by what power or by what name have ye done this? If Peter had simply stood there and said by Jehovah God this had been done, then they might not have had such a fight. But even that would have been a compromise. And there are people today that they try to preach the word in such a way as not to get anybody offended. No. When Peter said there, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, <laughs> that was a detestable name there. That means that one that came in the flesh was none other than God in the flesh, else how could he have healed this lame man and whom Ye crucified, but God raised from the dead. You know, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, so he was going right at them. When he said, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. And spiritually, I can say there's no sinner ever that has stood made whole other than through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's where Peter declared, this is the stone which... Here it's put as set it not. You know, when it talks about it being set aside, it doesn't mean now that it somehow was not effectual. No, they set it at naught, but God never did because he, it says here, which has become, it was set it not by the builders, but is become the head of the corner. And so verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that's the message we have to declare today. That this is God's salvation. How did the builders reject this one? Well, they never approved or agreed to his origin. Because he was from God. Even though he came in the flesh, that wasn't his beginning. He came from on high. They did not like him because he did not cater to their religion or their forms of education. Christ did not go to the rab rabbinic schools to get his training. And uh, they didn't like him. They set him at naught because he would not approve their religious traditions. All of these things. And it's like today. When you don't 
give credence to man. And I find that even in preaching this message that gives Christ all the glory. That's how you know it's the gospel. But you'll have people sit and listen to you that get upset because they're listening for one thing. Well, what's my part in it? And that's where we have preachers today. That's why people like them. It's not because they're preaching the gospel, but the preacher is bolstering up the people, making them feel better about themselves. When they tell people that God has done all he can do, but now it's up to you, you take the first step and then God will do the rest. How many times we've heard that kind of preaching? What does that do with man? It empowers him. Oh, I'm the key here. Someone asked the question one time, and I, the questions, and I, I, I love it, the way it's put, that if God had willed that everybody be saved, and yet not everybody is saved, what does the will of God have to do with salvation? It must not have anything to do with it, since not everybody's saved. And then someone added and said, if God loves everybody without exception, and yet not everybody's saved, what does the love of God have to do with salvation? And here's the big one. If Christ died, shed his blood to save every single person in the world, and yet not every single person is saved, what does that say about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Must not have anything to do with salvation. Ultimately, what these are saying when they preach that is the power and the salvation is in your hands. It must be then man that makes the difference. And that's just so foreign to what we find in the scriptures. But that's the message that people like to hear. They want to hear that, but they will not, just like these, hear of one that God has made to be the chief cornerstone. And that's how Christ is the forerunner. This work was not done until he came and finished it. And when it says he became the chief cornerstone, that means this had, he had to come. He had to fulfill these things. The outworking of this salvation had to be through him. And that chief cornerstone, the capstone, well, that's the most important stone in the foundation. There's no other foundation that can be laid than that which is laid. And so, as I said, in verse, to wrap this up in verse 24, verse 23, this is the Lord's doing. It's all, all the glory belongs unto him, but this is the day that the Lord hath made. When it says, this is the Lord's doing, underscore that. There's no room for man in here. It's his doing from beginning to end. Certainly, it wasn't the doing of the religious leaders. Yes, by God's determinate will, he delivered his son into their hands. And in so doing, they actually offered up the Lamb of God, which is what the priests were to do anyway. But in their rebellion, they, they did it in their anger. They did what they willed, but at the same time, they accomplished the will of God. But the credit certainly can't go to the religious leaders. They rejected him. You couldn't give it to the Roman leaders, even though Pilate's the one that delivered him up to crucify him. It says this is the Lord's doing. It certainly wasn't even the doing of the disciples because they did everything they could to stop it. They were ignorant even at that point of what it meant for the Lord Jesus Christ to have to come and lay down his life. And there, in and of itself, to me, indicates I'm thankful that our justification is not based on how well we see Christ. No, it's how he sees us and what he accomplished on our behalf. I do believe this, if he paid our sin debt, he will in time draw everyone to himself. And as he draws us and teaches us, even through studying the word now, all of this becomes clearer. But it's not how we see it that is our salvation. It's what he accomplished that is our salvation. That day that he made, our Lord Jesus Christ quoted this 
particular Psalm 118 and verse 22. He was doing that in response to the praise and the hosannas that were being given to him even as he entered into the city of Jerusalem. And uh, certainly that day is for us one of rejoicing because we know that it would not have taken place had not God purposed it and given his son a people that he would come and save and now has accomplished all that was given him to do. And therefore, as we're given eyes to see, we rejoice. Well, I hope that's helpful. We'll come back next time to verses 25 down to the end of the chapter and see how Christ is that one and only true sacrifice to the satisfaction of God. That's how the psalm ends. But we'll look forward to seeing that next time, the Lord willing. Amen.